I want to see you, said Tom intently. Get on the next train. All right. I'll meet you by the newsstand on the lower level. She nodded and moved away from him just as George Wilson emerged with two chairs from his office door. We waited for her down the road and out of sight. It was a few days before the 4th of July, and a gray, scrawny Italian child was setting torpedoes in a row along the railroad track. Terrible place, isn't it, said Tom, exchanging a frown with Dr. Eckelberg. Awful. It does her good to get away. Doesn't her husband object, Wilson? He thinks she goes to see her sister in New York. He's so dumb he doesn't know he's alive. So Tom Buchanan and his girl and I went up together to New York or not quite together, for Mrs. Wilson sat discreetly in another car. Tom deferred that much to the sensibilities of those East Eggers who might be on the train. She had changed her dress to a brown-figured muslin, which stretched tight over her rather wide hips as Tom helped her to the platform in New York. At the newsstand she bought a copy of Town Tattle and a moving picture magazine, and in the station drugstore some cold cream and a small flask of perfume. Upstairs, in the solemn echoing drive she let four taxicabs drive away before she selected a new one, lavender colored with gray upholstery, and in this. We slid out from the mass of the station into the glowing sunshine. But immediately she turned sharply from the window and, leaning forward, tapped on the front glass. I want to get one of those dogs, she said earnestly. I want to get one for the apartment. They're nice to have a dog. We backed up to a gray old man who bore an absurd resemblance to John D. Rockefeller. In a basket swung from his neck cowered a dozen very recent puppies of an indeterminate breed. What kind are they? Asked Mrs. Wilson eagerly, as he came to the taxi window. All kinds. What kind do you want, lady? I'd like to get one of those police dogs I don't suppose you got that kind? The man peered doubtfully into the basket, plunged in his hand and drew one up, wriggling, by the back of the neck. That's no police dog, said Tom. No, it's not exactly a police dog, said the man with disappointment in his voice. It's more of an Airedale. He passed his hand over the brown washrag of a back. Look at that coat. Some coat. That's a dog that'll never bother you with catching cold. I think it's cute, said Mrs. Wilson enthusiastically. How much is it? That dog? He looked at it admiringly. That dog will cost you ten dollars. The Airedale undoubtedly there was an Airedale concerned in it somewhere, though its feet were startlingly white changed hands and settled down into Mrs. Wilson's lap, where she fondled the weatherproof coat with rapture. Is it a boy or a girl? She asked delicately. That dog? That dog's a boy. It's a bitch, said Tom decisively. Here's your money. Go and buy ten more dogs with it. Ten. I want to see you, said Tom intently. Get on the next train. All right, I'll meet you by the newsstand on the lower level. She nodded and moved away from him just as George Wilson emerged with two chairs from his office door. We waited for her down the road and out of sight. It was a few days before the 4th of July, and a gray, scrawny Italian child was setting torpedoes in a row along the railroad track. This passage depicts Tom Buchanan arranging a secret meeting with his mistress, Myrtle Wilson, at a train station. They agree to meet by the newsstand on the lower level. As Myrtle moves away from Tom, George Wilson, her husband, emerges from his office with two chairs. Tom and his companion wait for Myrtle out of sight, as they observe a scrawny Italian child setting torpedoes along the railroad track. In the context of the passage, the phrase, setting torpedoes in a row, refers to the act of the child. Placing explosive devices, known as torpedoes, in a line along the railroad track. The torpedoes were commonly used as warning signals to alert train engineers of upcoming hazards or obstructions on the track. However, in this scene, the child's intentions for placing the torpedoes are unclear, and it is left up to interpretation. The use of the word, scrawny, in the description of the child suggests that he is thin and malnourished. Which could be interpreted as a commentary on the poverty and economic struggles of the lower classes during the time period in which the novel is set. Overall, 
the image of the child setting torpedoes in a row along the railroad track adds to the sense of danger, instability, and decay that permeates the world of the novel. 11. Terrible place, isn't it? said Tom, exchanging a frown with Dr. Eckelberg. Awful. It does her good to get away. Doesn't her husband object? Wilson? He thinks she goes to see her sister in New York. He's so dumb he doesn't know he's alive. This passage depicts Tom Buchanan and his companion discussing Myrtle Wilson's relationship with her husband, George Wilson. Tom and his companion exchange a frown as they remark on the terrible and awful nature of the place they are in. They go on to discuss Myrtle and her husband, with Tom stating that it does Myrtle good to get away. When asked if George objects, Tom dismisses him as being dumb and unaware of Myrtle's true whereabouts. As he believes she tells him she is visiting her sister in New York. This passage further highlights the theme of deception and the superficiality of relationships in the novel. Myrtle is involved in an extramarital affair with Tom and lies to her husband about her whereabouts. Tom, on the other hand, shows little regard for Myrtle's well-being and views her simply as a means of escape from his own unhappy marriage. The use of the word, dumb, to describe George Wilson adds to the overall sense of class division and superiority that permeates the novel. 12. So Tom Buchanan and his girl and I went up together to New York or not quite together, for Mrs. Wilson sat discreetly in another car. Tom deferred that much to the sensibilities of those East Eggers who might be on the train. She had changed her dress to a brown-figured muslin, which stretched tight over her rather wide hips as Tom helped her to the platform in New York. At the newsstand she bought a copy of Town Tattle and a moving picture magazine, and in the station drugstore some cold cream and a small flask of perfume. Upstairs, in the solemn echoing drive she let four taxicabs drive away before she selected a new one, lavender colored with gray upholstery, and in this. We slid out from the mass of the station into the glowing sunshine. But immediately she turned sharply from the window and, leaning forward, tapped on the front glass. This passage depicts Tom Buchanan and his mistress, Myrtle Wilson, traveling together to New York City. Myrtle is described as sitting discreetly in another car, as Tom defers to the sensibilities of those on the train. In this context, the phrase, deferred that much to the sensibilities of those East Eggers, means that Tom Buchanan chose to travel separately from his mistress. Myrtle Wilson, in order to avoid any potential social awkwardness or scandal that might arise from being seen together on the train by people from the upper-class community of East Egg. Tom, who is from the wealthy community of East Egg, is aware of the social norms and expectations of his class and does not want to risk his reputation or status by being seen in a compromising situation. This demonstrates the importance of social status and appearances in the world of the novel, and how characters are willing to make choices that uphold their social standing, even at the cost of personal happiness or morality. When they arrive in New York, Myrtle has changed into a brown muslin dress that stretches tight over her wide hips. She stops at a newsstand to purchase magazines and beauty products, including cold cream and perfume. As they leave the station, Myrtle selects a lavender-colored taxi with gray upholstery. However, she quickly turns away from the window and taps on the front glass, indicating that she wants to buy a dog. This passage highlights Myrtle's desire for material possessions and a higher social status. She buys magazines to keep up with the latest gossip and beauty products to enhance her appearance. In this context, Town Tattle refers to a gossip magazine that Myrtle Wilson purchases at the newsstand. The magazine likely contains information and rumors about the lives of wealthy and influential people in New York City, and Myrtle's interest in. It reflects her desire to be part of the glamorous world of the rich and famous. 13. I want to get one of those dogs, she said earnestly. I want to get one for the apartment. They're nice to have a dog. We backed up to a gray old man who bore an absurd resemblance to John D. Rockefeller. In a basket swung from his neck cowered a dozen very recent puppies of an indeterminate breed. What kind are they? asked Mrs. Wilson eagerly, as he came to the taxi window. All kinds. What kind do you want, lady? I'd like to get one of those police dogs I don't suppose you got that kind? The man peered doubtfully into the basket. 
plunged in his hand and drew one up, wriggling, by the back of the neck. That's no police dog, said Tom. No, it's not exactly a police dog, said the man with disappointment in his voice. It's more of an Airedale. He passed his hand over the brown wash rag of a back. Look at that coat. Some coat. That's a dog that'll never bother you with catching cold. I think it's cute, said Mrs. Wilson enthusiastically. How much is it? That dog? He looked at it admiringly. That dog will cost you ten dollars. The Airedale undoubtedly there was an Airedale concerned in it somewhere, though its feet were startlingly white changed hands and settled down into Mrs. Wilson's lap, where she fondled the weatherproof coat with rapture. Is it a boy or a girl? She asked delicately. That dog? That dog's a boy. It's a bitch, said Tom decisively. Here's your money. Go and buy ten more dogs with it. In this passage, Myrtle Wilson expresses a desire to get a dog for her apartment, and they come across a gray old man selling puppies on the street. The speaker notes that the man bears an absurd resemblance to John D. Rockefeller, a wealthy American businessman and philanthropist who lived during the late 19th and early 20th centuries. The description of the old man as resembling Rockefeller is likely intended to be humorous and satirical. Rockefeller was one of the richest and most powerful men of his time, and his name became synonymous with wealth and privilege. By comparing the old man to Rockefeller, the speaker is highlighting the absurdity of the situation and underscoring the differences between the wealthy characters in the novel and the working-class people they encounter. Myrtle asks if he has any police dogs, but the man offers her an Airedale instead. The man admires the Airedale's coat and assures Myrtle that it is a good dog that will never catch a cold. In this context, the speaker is referring to the Airedale puppy's appearance. The Airedale breed typically has a brown and black coat, and their feet are usually black. However, the puppy that Myrtle purchases has startlingly white feet, which is unusual for the breed. The description of the puppy's white feet serves to emphasize its uniqueness and individuality, as well as to highlight Myrtle's desire for something that is distinct and stands out. The fact that she chooses a puppy with unusual features suggests that she is seeking something that is not typical or ordinary which reflects her desire for status and distinction in a world that values appearances and material possessions. Myrtle is enthusiastic about the dog and asks about its gender, delicately using the term, boy or girl. Tom, however, decides to correct the man and declares that the dog is a female. Despite the confusion over the dog's gender, Myrtle purchases the Airedale for $10 and holds it in her lap, showing affection and delight. This scene further emphasizes the materialism and superficiality of the characters in the novel. Myrtle's desire to own a dog is portrayed as a symbol of her longing for status and luxury. Additionally, Tom's corrections regarding the dog's gender are indicative of his desire to exert control and dominance over Myrtle. The scene is also somewhat comical, with the characters bickering over the gender of the dog and its breed. I want to see you, said Tom intently. Get on the next train. All right. I'll meet you by the newsstand on the lower level. She nodded and moved away from him just as George Wilson emerged with two chairs from his office door. We waited for her down the road and out of sight. It was a few days before the 4th of July, and a gray, scrawny Italian child was setting torpedoes in a row along the railroad track. Terrible place, isn't it? said Tom, exchanging a frown with Dr. Eckelberg. Awful. It does her good to get away. Doesn't her husband object? Wilson? He thinks she goes to see her sister in New York. He's so dumb he doesn't know he's alive. So Tom Buchanan and his girl and I went up together to New York or not quite together, for Mrs. Wilson sat discreetly in another car. Tom deferred that much to the sensibilities of those East Eggers who might be on the train. She had changed her dress to a brown-figured muslin which stretched tight over her rather wide hips as Tom helped her to the platform in New York. At the newsstand she bought a copy of Town Tattle and a moving picture magazine, and in the station drugstore some cold cream and a small flask of perfume. Upstairs, in the solemn echoing drive she let four taxicabs drive away before she selected a new one, lavender colored with gray upholstery, and in this. We slid out from the mass of the station into the glowing sunshine. 
but immediately she turned sharply from the window and, leaning forward, tapped on the front glass. I want to get one of those dogs, she said earnestly. I want to get one for the apartment. They're nice to have a dog. We backed up to a gray old man who bore an absurd resemblance to John D. Rockefeller. In a basket swung from his neck cowered a dozen very recent puppies of an indeterminate breed. What kind are they? Asked Mrs. Wilson eagerly, as he came to the taxi window. All kinds. What kind do you want, lady? I'd like to get one of those police dogs I don't suppose you got that kind? The man peered doubtfully into the basket, plunged in his hand and drew one up, wriggling, by the back of the neck. That's no police dog, said Tom. No, it's not exactly a police dog, said the man with disappointment in his voice. It's more of an Airedale. He passed his hand over the brown washrag of a back. Look at that coat. Some coat. That's a dog that'll never bother you with catching cold. I think it's cute, said Mrs. Wilson enthusiastically. How much is it? That dog? He looked at it admiringly. That dog will cost you ten dollars. The Airedale undoubtedly there was an Airedale concerned in it somewhere, though its feet were startlingly white changed hands and settled down into Mrs. Wilson's lap, where she fondled the weatherproof coat with rapture. Is it a boy or a girl? She asked delicately. That dog? That dog's a boy. It's a bitch, said Tom decisively. Here's your money. Go and buy ten more dogs with it.